an impossible life. From childhood up, an impossible life, the work of God all the way through. David, David Livingston, listen up, was born in Blantyre, Scotland in 1813. He was born into a home where his father used to put him on his knee and read him stories of great missionary exploits. One particularly, Carl Gutzloff, the Dutch missionary who doubled up as a medical missionary too. And young David used to look into his father's eyes and say, you know, Daddy, one day I'm going to be a man like that. I want to be a missionary. I want to be a doctor. I want to serve God. So David Livingston in his young life got on his knees one day and prayed this prayer, Lord, send me anywhere, only go with me. Lay any burden on me, only sustain me, sever any ties, but the ties that bind me to your service and to your heart, I want that, I want that. And he said through it all, the words of God came to me, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. He packed his bags and went off to Africa, and when he took one glimpse of Africa in the distance from the ship deck, he penned in his journals these words, the haunting specter of the smoke of a thousand villages in the morning sun has burned into my heart. He married a woman of the famous Moffat family, Mary was her name, her father had been a great missionary. But David Livingston's life was one of an explorer. He would move from place to place. His only goal was Jesus in the lives of men and women, thousands of them. Finally, his wife and his young family couldn't keep up with him anymore. Some of his children were dying of sickness, disease. He said, Mary, why don't you take them back home? I will see you shortly, and I'll spend some time with you. It's too dangerous here. So she went, took them back home, and he continued on his travels. And do you know when he saw her again the next time? Not five days, not five months, but five years. Five years later, when he set his eyes upon his wife, she could not recognize him. Because at one stage in his jungle travels, going to preach, he had walked into the branch of a tree that had completely blinded him in one eye and marred the other. His face had been burnt under the African sun to a crisp of leather, and his, son wasn't, his skin wasn't pigmented for it, so he had roasted his skin to the point where his body almost couldn't handle it any longer. At one time, he had been attacked by a, li a lion. It had torn his shoulder, and he just miraculously escaped. When Mary saw her husband again, hobbling in, with a marred face and a physical, disfigured physical countenance. And only hours before Livingston arrived back in England, they buried his father. And Livingston, when he got there, wept because he had missed his father's by a few hours and he had wanted to tell him stories firsthand that his father had told him thirdhand. Biographical sketches tell us that when David Livingston walked into every university in the British Isle, students and faculty would rise to their feet in a standing ovation. They knew they were standing in the presence of a giant of a man. Finally, Livingston went back to his wife one day and said, Honey, the haunting specter of the smoke of a thousand villages is still burning in my heart. I have to go back. They agreed that he would go back. They said that Mary would stay back with the children because she, they could not handle it again. Several, uh, a while later, Mary finally joined, um, joined Livingston again, and the day she stepped foot on African soil, that day she contracted a disease that they so dreaded she would contract, and a few days later, Livingston was burying her. An eyewitness said David Livingston knelt by the grave and was weeping his heart out, and they overheard him praying, my Jesus, my King, my life, my all, I again consecrate my life to thee. I shall place no value in anything I possess or in anything I may do except in relation to thy kingdom and thy service. And through it all, he said, there came the words of God into my heart. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. He packed his belongings and went back to his hometown of Ujiji. When he arrived there, to his little home, he found that someone had played a cruel trick on him and had stolen the medication he so needed because his body was racked with unbearable pain. That was one of the few times in his life that he prayed for himself. He said, God, you promised that you would always be with me. I need that medication if I am to continue to preach the gospel. And as he prayed, he heard steps, and as the story goes, he saw a pair of feet planted in front of him, and as his countenance lifted, for the first time, he was looking into the face of a white man who did not live in Africa, who said the famous line, Dr. Livingston, I presume. He said, yes, I feel thankful I'm here to welcome you. He said, Dr. Livingston, I'm a press reporter consigned to do a story on your life, and I want you to know two things about me. The first, I'm the biggest swaggering atheist on the planet, Please don't try to convert me. The second, someone sent medication for you. He said, give me the medication, please. 
Mr. Henry M. Stanley started to travel with David Livingston, and four months later, the biggest swaggering atheist on the face of the earth knelt down on African soil and gave his life to Christ. He said the power of that Christ life was awesome. I had to buckle in. I could not hold out any longer. Finally, with Livingston, his body began to shrivel with the high temperatures and the pain they used to carry him from village to village on a stretcher because he could not, he could not stand or walk anymore. One day as he was preaching, he was, he was feeling so badly, he said to his African brothers, please take me home, I'm very ill. I need some sleep. They took him back, and as he got there, they were put out to put him in his bed, and he said, don't, don't put me in my bed. I want to help me onto my knees. I want to pray. So they put him on his knees, and he began to pray. His prayers were so profound. His sanctuary with God so unique that the African brothers thought it would be blasphemy to stay in the presence of this single union and communion with God. They stepped out of the room. Someone came running a little bit later and said, I need to see Dr. Livingston. They said, shh, quiet, please, he's praying. Shortly thereafter that, they looked in. He was still on his knees. Five minutes after that, they looked in. He was still on his knees. A while later, they looked in again. He was still on his knees, and they were like, we just need to go put him to bed. He's, he, he needs sleep. They went over and one of them shook his shoulder and said, Buana? Buana? Livingston fell over. He was dead. He died exactly the way he had lived, in the presence of his Lord. He didn't run from God's voice. He didn't wave a lamp that had no light in it. He didn't sell out his soul to some earthly pleasure. The haunting specter of the smoke of a thousand villages had burned itself within his heart until he could say, My Jesus, my King, my life, my all, I again consecrate myself to you. By the way, that life was impossible. And we all may as well accept it right now. It was impossible. It would be impossible for us to live that life, and it was impossible also for David Livingston. The only way is if the power of Christ comes and dwells within us. That's why we need a Savior. That's why we have a theme at the cross. Don't take what anybody says to you at this conference for the, don't take their word for it. Go back and study the Word of God and see if it is true. We want, we want the Almighty Jesus. We want the right Jesus. We want the Jesus of the Bible, not a Jesus of our own invention, because He stands ready and willing to pour His life into the heart of anyone who will lean on Him and lean hard. When the life of God is unleashed in His people again, the world will take note. God does not stand back and say, only once every half a century I will, do, I will live through someone like I lived through David Livingston. No, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are perfect towards him. We're going to sing a song as a family tonight. My appeal to you is this. We're at the very beginning of GYC. If you hear something that's impossible, say praise the Lord. Because it's his life, not ours. The only way we'll be able to live a life that glorifies God is if we pour ourselves down and lean on him. If it's all him living in us. I just want you to bow your heads and pray through this. And right now, lean on him. Lean hard. Even if you don't have the inclination, if you don't know how, ask him to show you. And he will. Some, he will this weekend. We're going to sing a song called God Alone. And just meditate on the words as we sing it.
soul. 